Okay, I'm sick, but I'm in China. And to be sick in China means it's a perfect time to uh, use the mind, since the body is not real good. And what I'm reading right now, as you can see, is the Tao Te Ching, the earliest classic of, uh, of Taoism in China. The author is Lao Tzu, L-A-O-Z-I, or so it is said, but like so many ancient texts, we're really not sure. And this is chapter 16 of the Tao Te Ching, and it will confuse you, but if you follow and want to see, it brings out some really, really beautiful and fascinating differences between the Chinese world and its views of self, particularly and the Western world and its view of self, but it brings out more than that. So I'm reading the Tao Te Ching from Guangxi province in China right now on a cold February day, February 15th, chapter 16. Extend your utmost emptiness as far as you can and do your best to preserve your equilibrium. Now, you should be confused, because this is so non-Western that it's just way beyond what we're used to thinking. Notice it is telling you, me, everybody, to extend your emptiness as far as you, as far as you can. Your utmost emptiness. So be as empty as you can, but then extend it as far as you can. To extend emptiness implies that you are related to the space around you. And it's not just any space, it's the space of the moment in time that you find yourself in. And this is key to understanding really not just Taoists, but also Confucian. They disagree on a lot of things, but they agree on a lot of things too. And one of the things they agree upon is that the self is always in relation to its context. Your self is not a cell. It's not like some walled off soul that's permanent and unchanging. On the contrary, it's the exact opposite. Your self is always surrounded by a field of other things and because you're seeing through yourself you are the focus of that field but you don't exist outside of that field and that field is always changing the field around me right now is the the region of Yangshuo in Guangxi China and the people in it in this hotel and on and on and on and that field will be different tomorrow and the day after and the day after and every moment really. So extend your utmost emptiness as far as you can and do your best to preserve your equilibrium. So the implication is equilibrium, balance, spiritual or mental balance has to do with how far you can extend your emptiness into the field around you. In the process of all things emerging together, we can witness their reversion. Keywords here are process. Again, in the West we think of things, and things don't change. We think of soul, and it's something that lives forever, and it's us. We think of nouns. China really thinks of verbs, of processes. Not permanent, but the opposite, changing, always becoming. So not nouns, but verbs. In the process of all things emerging together, this is the Taoist way of talking about reality. And it's a pretty good definition of reality if you think about it, especially if you think about it locally, the local reality, but really it's, it's the entire universe. 
Everything is emerging, everything is coming out, all things are coming out together. You are not alone in your field. There are a million other creatures, from insect life to cell life to animal life to plant life, all emerging together in the same field. In the process of all things emerging together, and that concept is Wan Wu in, in Chinese, we can witness their reversion. Reversion means turning around and going back to an earlier state. And notice that we as humans, and it's particularly enlightened humans or sage, sage humans. So in the process of all things emerging together, we can witness their returning to an earlier state, their reversion. Things proliferate and each again returns to its root. What does proliferate mean? I can't make the text larger, that's a drag. To increase rapidly in numbers, to multiply, to reproduce rapidly. To produce something in larger increasing, increasing quantities. So to proliferate, to become more and more complex, more and more numerous, things proliferate and each again returns to its root. So we see this couplet is really just a restatement of this couplet, right? Things proliferate, that's the process of all things emerging together. Each again returns to its root, that's things reverting to their earlier state. Returning to the root is called equilibrium. Now, as for equilibrium, this is called returning to the propensity of things. So returning to the root is called equilibrium. And equilibrium is called returning to the propensity of things. What is propensity? an inclination or natural tendency to behave in a particular way. This is a Western definition, and if I were to read it with empathy towards the Chinese way of thinking, I would rephrase it and say, it is behaving according to a natural tendency, behaving according to nature to not behave unnaturally. So, equilibrium, this is called returning to the propensity of things, the natural way of things. And then, returning to the propensity of things, and this is where Chinese philosophy can be so deep and so simple at the same time. Returning to the propensity of things is common sense. So to live according to the natural way of things is common sense. Using common sense is acuity. What's acuity? Mental sharpness, I would say. But we'll see what the dictionary says. Sharpness or keenness of thought, vision, or hearing. Using common sense is mental sharpness. While failing to use it, is to lose control and to try to do anything while out of control is to court disaster to flirt with disaster using common sense is to be accommodating no, I can't do that now these little dictionary travels are um, are worth doing. Let's see now. Oh, I can't. No, I can't. Accommodating. So what was our line here? 
using common sense, in other words, common sense is defined in the Tao Te Ching, is behaving according to nature's tendencies. So, what are nature's tendencies? Fitting in with someone's wishes or demands in a helpful way. Accommodating. It's not about you trying to fit your field to help you. It's not about trying to make the world fit your wishes and your demands to help you. It's fitting in with someone else's wishes or everything's wishes or demands in a helpful way. Using common sense is to be accommodating. Being accommodating is tolerance. Being tolerant is kingliness. Being kingly is tin-like. That should be L-I-K-E. Being kingly is tin-like. Being tin-like is to be way-making. Now this way is of course the word Tao. And these authors translate it not as um, way-making is, uh, they, they call it way-making because they want to focus on the fact that it's practice. It's not knowledge, it's practice. So being tin-like is to be way-making. And the way made is enduring. When you practice the Tao, it lasts. Your practice makes you able to continue making the Tao, making the way. And it's the way of nature. To the end of one's days, one will be free of danger. Now here's the commentary, and this is going to be thick. But it was one of the most beautiful pieces of reading. I've read it several times over the past couple of weeks, and it really hits at the difference between East and West so, so deeply and so well. See if you can appreciate it. We're getting at the difference between East and West, and although these guys are going to talk about Greek philosophy and Christian theology and compare it to Taoist and possibly Confucian, differences. Those differences are still at the root of the way we see the world and the way we behave in it, the way we practice life. So this is deep stuff. And these ancient connections are not irrelevant because we're, we're in the flow of history. And we inherited these, these ways of thinking and being from our culture. So here's their commentary. The optimum posture the most effective, the best posture of the heart and mind, Sheen. I love that. The Chinese version of mind is this word, Sheen. The optimum posture of the heart and mind, and notice, well, we'll get to it, is to achieve and sustain an emptiness and equilibrium that will enable it to take in the world as it is without imposing its own presuppositions upon it and without allowing the world to cause it agitation. So what is the sage in Taoism? This is a really good sentence to kind of sum it up. It's being empty and balanced so that you can take in the world as it is that field around you. And you can do that without imposing your own presuppositions upon it. You're not seeing it with all your categories and prejudices already made, but instead you're seeing it openly and fresh and new. And so the world is, is all of those myriad things are emerging all around you, and you're just taking it in. Without imposing, your, without imposing your own presuppositions upon it, your own judgments, your own definitions, your own anything. But at the same time, you're not allowing it to cause you agitation. So that world is emerging all around you, all of the myriad things are emerging all around you, they're coming into being, they're proliferating, yada yada, all around you, and you are taking it in, taking in that world, 
without allowing it to cause you agitation. Agitation is a negative thing. It's getting you confused. It's getting you anxious and stressed. No. The Tao in in uh, Taoism is to be empty and balanced, and so open to the world that you can take it all in, but not impose anything on it, and not allow it to impose any sort of stress on you. They continue. It's significant that Sheen, a stylized drawing of the aorta of the heart. So in China, thinking happens in the heart, not in the mind. Feeling and thinking are together. It's significant that Sheen, a stylized drawing of the aorta, precludes the assumption of distinctions between thinking and feeling. In other words, what they're saying is that it's really important to realize that in ancient Chinese and and until today, um, to some degree, thinking and feeling cannot be separated the way we do in the West. It's significant that she precludes the assumption, makes impossible the assumption of distinctions between thinking and feeling. They can't be distinguished apart from each other. In China, they are part of the same thing. So you cannot assume distinctions between thinking and feeling or idea and affect. Affect is simply feeling or emotion. Xin is frequently translated simply as heart, but since it is the seat of thinking and judgment, the notion of mind must be included in its characterization, if the term is to be properly understood. Indeed, the functional equivalent of what we think of as purpose or intention is also implicit in the notion of seeing. So everything from purpose, intention, willpower, or will, you know, your purpose, your intention, your will, as well as judgment and thinking, and feeling. They're all seated in this concept of Xin. Going back to Plato, I told you we were going to go to Greek philosophy, here we are. Going all the way back to Plato, who was alive around the time of Confucius and, and Lao Tzu, the 400s and early 300s. Going back to Plato, BC. The Western tradition has been accustomed to construe efforts aimed at moral perfection as involving an internal struggle between reason and passion. Let me break that down. In Plato, since Plato, Western ways of thinking about thought, feeling, intention, and the Tao of goodness, of moral perfection, the Western tradition has been accustomed to construe efforts aimed at moral, moral perfection, construe, to think of, uh, conceptualize. So the Western tradition has been accustomed to conceptualize efforts aimed at moral perfection as involving, and here's the key point, an internal struggle between reason and passion. Now you see where they're going. Reason is the mind and passion is the heart. So in the West, these two things are in conflict inside of us. According to Plato, passion is unruly and unintelligent and not to be trusted, and reason is its, should be its master, according to Plato. Or, with Augustine, and here's the Christian, St. Augustine, late Roman Empire, between what we know we ought to do, righteousness, um, you know, Christian state of not sinning, and an obstreperous will that frustrates our acting upon that knowledge. So Augustine is saying, we know from the Bible what we ought to do, but our fallen willpower, because Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, and so we're all fallen and we're, we're born evil, frustrates our acting upon what we know from the Bible we ought to do. So again, in both of these, we see in the West, 
this view of the individual as somebody who is divided inside between a good and a bad, and so there's conflict in us. The self is in conflict. For the Greeks, for philosophy, it was reason versus passion, mind versus heart, and for the Christians, it was saintliness or holiness or righteousness and temptation and sin that frustrates that desire to be a saint. Okay, The main idea of this, and it's, it's huge for difference between East and West, is that in the West again we are by nature, whether you're talking about the Greeks or the Christians, conflicted individuals. We're not in harmony. We are not harmonious selves. We ourselves in conflict with ourselves. Now let's get back to China. The interpenetration of so these three these three things are mixing and together. The interpenetration of idea, thinking, intention, willpower, and affect, emotion, expressed in the notion of Xin, suggests that in the classical Chinese world, the conflict associated with, with self-consummation, and to consummate means, means to make perfect, the conflict associated with self-consummation is not turned inward as a struggle between the heart and mind, that is, between the passions and reason, or between the will and judgment. If the dynamic of self-consummation does not entail the self divided against itself like it does in the West, what is the source and the nature of the disturbance that the cultivation of an appropriate personal disposition is meant to overcome? A long, complicated sentence, but stay with me because it, we're almost finished, first of all. And second of all, we're, we're coming to the climax. So, if in the West the problem is internal, we're in conflict with ourselves, we can't trust our senses and our desires and our heart and our, uh, um, our passions, uh, we either trust the Bible or our reason, depending on whether you're talking Greek or Christian. Well, if in China the process of perfecting yourself doesn't involve this Western notion, either one, the Greek or the Christian, what is the source of the disturbance that the Chinese say we need to overcome? in order to consummate ourselves, to make ourselves perfect. If agitation is not referenced primarily within one's soul, and again, agitation, that's the problem, right? Agitation is stress, agitation is confusion, it's, it's, it's unhappiness. And to be upset is to be agitated. So if agitation is not referenced primarily within one's soul, as it is in the West, it can only be, and here it is, it can only be a disturbance in the relationships that constitute the self and its interactions with external things. I, up above when we were talking about the text itself, we were talking about focus and field, the self as the focal point in a context, a field of reality that is always specific. Your context is always specific. So if agitation, unhappiness, confusion, stress is not referenced primarily within one's soul, it can only be a disturbance for, for the Chinese in the relationships, relationships that constitute the self and its interactions with external things. We talked in class about Confucianism being uh, having a sense of self as not an individual, an I, but as instead as more of a me. A concept of self as being a collection of roles that you play, natural roles. I am not Clay Burrell. I am the son of my father, the husband of my wife, the father of my children, the brother of my siblings, the friend of my friends, and the subject of my ruler. That's who I am. I'm not just some eternal soul called Clay. And so for And so my relationships 
with these external things should not be disturbed because if they are then I can't be a sage because after all wisdom is living the good life is it not so if agitation is not referenced primarily within one's soul as it is in the West either sin and temptation or else just passion and, and uh, passion and what unruly behavior it can only be a disturbance in the relationships that constitute the self in its interactions with external things. And so here is the unpacking of uh, another line up there that we'll get back to. It is through a mirroring of the things of the world as they are in their relations with us. A mirroring of the things of the world as they are, not as we want them to be, not as we're going to try to make them, but just as they are in their relations with us, that we reach a disposition in which none among the myriad things, myriad means thousands, it's just a way of saying everything, that we reach a disposition in which none of the myriad things is able to agitate our hearts and minds, our sheen, and we are best able to promote their flourishing. This notion of mirroring is one of the key notions of Taoism. And we'll, we'll stick with that in a minute. We'll go further with it. But notice this last part. It's not just about us being free of agitation. They can't agitate our hearts and mind because we're balanced, we're empty, we have equilibrium. But we also are best able to promote their flourishing. So as I walk through my field, it cannot agitate me, but more beautifully, because I'm balanced and empty, I am best able to promote everything in my field, promote its flourishing, its becoming better, its becoming more perfect. Here's a, a transition to uh, another text that we won't talk about in class, but Throughout the Huainanzi, we find reference to this mirror-like knowing. For example, in Huainanzi 6, I love this passage, sages are like a mirror. They neither see things off. When something leaves, they don't chase after it. No, don't leave, don't leave. Sages are like a mirror. They neither see things off, nor go out to meet them. Something's coming, they don't run out to meet it, and they don't chase after when something's going away, because mirrors do neither of those things. The mirror metaphor is beautiful. Mirrors accept everything that come into them as they reflect it, and they do it calmly, and when things leave the mirror, they leave it calmly. Sages are like a mirror. They neither see things off nor go out to meet them. They respond to everything without storing anything up. Thus they are never injured through the myriad transformations they undergo. So here is one ideal of Taoism. It's to walk from waking to going to sleep, to walk through every moment like a mirror. Westerners are going to say, that sounds so empty, that sounds so unemotional, that sounds so joyless. And Hall and Ames are going to rebut that understandable objection in the following commentary. This Taoist disposition is neither passive, so it's not passive like a mirror, and it's not quietistic. What is quietism? Whoops. Quietism. The abandonment of the will as a form of religious mysticism. Calm acceptance of things as they are without attempts to resist or change them. So being mirror-like is not passive 
or quietistic. It's not without like being without willpower or intention or anything like this. Mirroring is best seen as synergistic, the energy of all things combined, and responsive. And here we are again with this aesthetic thing, another thing that, that ritual and Taoism have in common, although they disagree so much. Like virtuoso dancing, mirroring is best seen as synergistic and responsive. Like virtuoso dancing, or charioting, or push hands, tuesho, in Tai Chi, where all the elements are in step and create a fluid, interdependent whole. Such emptiness and equilibrium, achieved at the root in the ordinary business of the day, allows for mutual accommodation. Mutual accommodation. You are the focus of your field, but everybody in class is also the focus of their own field, and you're all occupying the same field. So you're mutually accommodating each other. Mutually. Synergistic, responsive, like virtuoso dancing, where all the elements are in step, in a fluid, interdependent, interdependent whole. And the common sense that facilitates such accommodation, that makes such accommodation possible, this common sense, far from being trite or trivial, cliché or trivial, is the distilled wisdom of the ages. Chinese wisdom, like wisdom in most ancient cultures, was oral, passed down from generation to generation, in song, particularly, and verse, poetry. And so this is not just some sort of silly common sense. No, it's the distilled wisdom of the ages, a tried and true insight into the cadence of life, the rhythm of life, and as such is deserving of enormous respect. It's what the Western philosopher William James called a stage of equilibrium in the human mind's development. Here's our last paragraph. Accommodation, far from being passive or weak, is the source of the fullness of strength and influence, timeliness and efficacy. Efficacy means the ability to be effective. So accommodation, this empty tolerance of all things that attempts to help all things flourish as you move through them in your field. It's not passive, it's not weak, it's the source of fullness, it's the source of strength and influence, it's the source of timeliness, you're doing the right thing at the right time, and effectiveness. Indeed, accommodation is inclusionary, enabling one to extend oneself through patterns of deference. To defer means basically every time you say you first, opening the door for somebody, in any way saying you first, that's deference. So accommodation is inclusionary. It includes, it doesn't exclude, it's not me versus, it's, it includes. It enables one to extend oneself through patterns of deference. It is ordering the external, effected through inner tranquility. Because you are tranquil inside, empty inside, mirror-like inside, you can order the world outside of you by deferring to it. It is governing the trunk and branches by taking care of the root. It is bringing order to the myriad things by managing the gate through which they emerge. This is highly, highly, highly beautiful stuff, but it's also... Um, so beautiful that it requires slow reading, and I'm not, I, at this point I'm getting impatient. But I urge you to just like, you know, even pause this and just read the paragraph yourself until you get what it really brings out so well. This entire paragraph is about accommodation, making room for others, for everything else. It's bringing order to everything by managing the gate through which everything emerges. Accommodation, 
inclusivity, and tolerance are the most effective means of achieving a stable and enduring social, political, and cosmic order. This, then, is how the kingly and the numinous way is extended and maintained. Numinous, having a strong religious or, spirit or spiritual quality, indicating or suggesting the presence of a divinity. So accommodation is how the kingly and the numinous way is extended and maintained. So we see in the West then, again going back to it, the self is seen as something in conflict with its own dark side. And if you think of Christianity, it is the soul that is the concern, and the soul's fate after death. This is not to deny, deny that Christianity has an ethical value, you know, do unto others and, and, you know, the golden rule and all sorts of things. But still, especially in the institutional church-oriented salvation side, it's about avoiding sin and being strong enough to resist temptation. And that temptation comes from the body and the pleasures of the body. In Greek philosophy, it's the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing, but it's still an internal division. I have a conflict in, within myself. Whereas in China, it's not resisting sin. It's more keeping harmony, again. And the self is not in conflict with itself. The self's, the self's job is to relate with everything else in nature at a specific moment, openly, and accommodatingly trying to help all of it flourish. I would be interested to hear any of your thoughts on that. Again, this is done while sick, but um, there's so much here. This really hits so much about Taoism. 